America is home to 33 million small businesses, the beating heart of communities across the country. And proof that the American dream is still alive. This is a show about those dreamers and doers and the communities they serve. Their real life stories. Their struggles and successes. Their grit, determination, and passion. And the people who fight to keep their American dream alive. I'm Alfredo Ortiz. I'm Elaine Parker. And it's time for another episode of Main Street Matters. America's small business megaphone. Hi, and welcome to another episode of Main Street Matters. I'm Elaine Parker, the president of the Job Creators Network Foundation. And I'm Alfredo Ortiz, CEO of Job Creators Network. You can subscribe to the show at SalemPodcastNetwork.com or wherever you get your podcasts from. Today, we're joined by Lee Rizzuto, um, who has spent his entire career with Conair Corporation. His uh, grandfather and father actually co-founded um, the company. Um, and if you don't recognize Conair, uh, you should, because I'm sure that anyone listening or watching has probably owned a Conair hairdryer, hair product, or accessory sometime in their or life. Or even a phone. Or even a phone. Um, that is very possible because they obviously have a lot of different products. Um, his father was actually chairman and uh, almost 100% owner of the company until his death in December of 2017. Um, Lee rose to senior vice president for professional global uh, business units, and he was also appointed uh, U.S. consul general in Hamilton, Bermuda during the Trump administration. So looking forward to that conversation um, with Lee. Yeah, it's going to be fascinating. So I'm looking forward to it as well. Lee, welcome to Main Street Matters, America's small business megaphone. Thanks for joining us this morning. Thank, Thank you. you Glad to be with you. Well, um, I would be remiss to mention that uh, in my lifetime, um, which is kind of getting up there, but uh, that I at any time have multiple Conair products in my household. Um, obviously grew up using uh, Conair blow dryers, curling irons, everything you can think of. Um, but I wanted to talk to you about sort of the, the beginning and what inspired you to join the family business and some of the challenges that you encountered along the way and just talk a little bit about your personal story there. Oh, great. And thank you. Well, the, the Conair story is truly an American dream textbook type of story. My, uh, my grandfather and my father started the company together. My grandfather invented uh, what may seem pretty novel today, but it was uh, just a, a wire mesh hair roller. So if you visualize a, a spring wrapped with a piece of uh, nylon mesh over it, tucked in on the, the sides, that was literally the first product, but mm -hmm. revolutionary at the time for women to uh, uh, do their hair. And then subsequently, there was a second product, which would you tucked inside of that roller a, a bore bristle, and it became a brush roller. So it held better in the hair. But literally, as a child, every opportunity I got to go into the office or the warehouse uh, with my dad, it was always, to me, something I, I very much cherished and enjoyed. I never viewed it as work per se, but something that, I, from, for whatever reason, from a very, very young age, uh, I had this passion. I'm talking about five years old, six years old, seven years old, going into the office, putting hair rollers, in, building the roller, putting them in a tray, feeding the tray into a vacuum form machine, and you know, uh, making the master cartons. And this was in Brooklyn, New York, back in the early 60s. So although, uh, you know, I, I don't think I was being taken advantage of in respect to child labor laws, but it was something my dad enjoyed bringing me in and saw my enjoyment of embracing this uh, family business. Back in the, the late 60s, going into the early 70s, the, the company had its first electrical products. And uh, quickly that became uh, the hairdryer. And the company actually was not the inventor of the hairdryer, but this also speaks volumes to, uh, again, what, what you could do with the American dream. Back in the, uh, during the 60s into the 70s, most women would go into what was called a beauty parlor mm -hmm. and sit under a hooded uh, chair 
for two and three hours, they would get a service called the wash and set. That service generally cost about $7 or $8. And the women would be, they made like almost, uh, you know, uh, ladies would meet up in, in the beauty parlor and sit on, under these chairs and be in the, the uh, beauty parlor for two and three hours at a time. When we brought the hairdryer, our version, which we called the, the pistol grip hairdryer to market, we took a completely different approach and we would go city by city in all the major cities across the country, hire top uh, stylists, uh, people such as, as I'm sure you know, Videl Sassoon. He actually worked for wow. us uh, back in the day. And we would teach the local hairdressers how to do what we called a cut and blow. So we taught this, we taught the, the benefit of doing this new style and approach for women to have their hair done and actually men and women and a cut and blow, they could c complete in 20 to 30 minutes and charge 15 to $20 versus the, the wash and set for three hours at yeah. seven or $8. So it really was uh, revolutionary uh, at the time. At that point in time, I'm only 10 years old. But I still, you know, very much enjoyed going to the office and going from department to department, from doing inventory to loading the trucks, to picking orders, to uh, eventually I got to the service department, which, uh, you know, I found uh, uh, quite uh, enjoyable because that actually led me to engineering and product development. In, in, by the time I was in high school, I was already developing products, you know, during my uh, vacation time working at the company. And over the years, uh, it, it escalated and grew into uh, having brought to market probably about wow. a thousand products, I have about 25 uh, patents. Actually, I kind of stopped filing for patents because it was never critical to our business. Our business was getting the product to market getting it in the hands and the value to the consumer and yes if it's something completely novel we would you know certainly want to protect it but quite often our strength was getting the product to market in pretty much record-breaking time we ultimately sold product in 125 wow. plus countries and with that i had the opportunity to travel the world and in the traveling, it was for many reasons. It was to see customers, it was visiting trade shows, it was working with the existing and new suppliers. So it really became a, a, a tremendous opportunity that I took full advantage of in that respect. So Lee, I'm, I'm, I'm curious really quickly, is, is, was it a kind of like a gradual growth, uh, you know, the company or were there, was there one or two things that really kind of catapulted it to, uh, to, to what you know, the, the fame that it is today? There, there, was, there was a number of, of spikes uh, in, in respect to the business, under, understanding that, you know, from, 50, from 1959, when the company started with a $200 investment in the basement of uh, my dad and grandparents' home, to becoming a, a multi-billion dollar company, uh, you know, 40 and 50 years later. So, uh, there, there, there was a, a number of, of spikes, but it, it was a very steady growth uh, over the years. And together, we, we, you know, I would say minimum 50 to 60 percent of, of that growth was from within. And over the years, we did make a, a number of acquisitions, one, one of which, which is uh, pretty interesting. There was a back in. This would be, I believe, around uh, 1990 or so. We bought a company called Zotos. Oh. And it was a tremendous business deal for us because uh, Zotos was the largest permanent wave company in the world. They made the chemical for women to have their hair, what was called permed. And uh, we, we bought this company and mer mer merged it into our business. And what was really incredible, this is back at the point in time when the Japanese were trying to buy major brands right. and landmarks right, uh, right. throughout right. America. They, they came to us shortly after we bought the company and they said, we want to buy Zotos because from the beauty industry, they wanted to have a, uh, an iconic brand. So we told them it was uh, not for sale and uh, they went away. 
about six months goes by, they come back again. And they said, we want to buy Zotos. So again, they were told, no, the business is not for sale. This, this is a company by the name of Shiseido. And uh, Shiseido says, no, you don't understand. We'll pay you anything you want. Well, we originally bought the company for uh, about $71 million. And within five years, uh, had sold it to them for $330 million. So it was a, a tremendous uh, opportunity for the company also to uh, uh, settle any debts that we had as far as, as we, that we actually underwent mm. a leverage buyout, which was uh, very common back then, but it put tremendous debt on your books right, when right. you do the LBOs. And it got us uh, in a position to retire all that debt and put us in a very uh, strong position. Now, uh, I remember you mentioning something to me about a little, I think, store that you guys bought that turned into, I think, hundreds, if not international line, Sally's Beauty Supply. Is that correct? Well, Sally's uh, was a, a customer of ours. And we had, we had a very uh, strong relationship with Sally and all of our customers. We, uh, the motto of the company, which uh, unfortunately too often is uh, missed today is the customer is always right. So we always cherished our customers and regardless, you know, what the issues were to find solutions, whether we felt sometimes they, they were uh, overstretching or not. But the, the Sally operation, another, you know, a tremendous uh, uh, story for, for the country, it went from, uh, one store uh, by the gentleman of uh, Mike Renzulli, who were who was hired by Alberta Culver to take this little store in New Orleans and, and build it up. And he took that one store and brought it to over 4,000. Okay. All right. Yeah. I remember me men you mentioning Sally's Beauty Supply somehow. So, but that is a great story. But in, in respect to our business, just to, uh, share with you, you know, I, I think some impressive statistics that we, we accomplished. We uh, ultimately grew the business uh, into several different categories. And within those categories, we actually produced over 100 million appliances per year. We, we sold and produced 100 million hairbrushes and hair accessories per year. And uh, at one time, we were actually in the telephone business, and uh, at while we were in it, we were the largest uh, marketer and seller of uh, consumer telephones in, in the country. Unfortunately, that business was a, a zero profit type of business, so ultimately the decision was just to exit it. But how we got into it was pretty interesting because at a trade show, uh, Sam Walton got into an elevator with my dad. And he said, Rizzuto, I want you to make telephones. But we don't know anything about telephones. And Walton said, but you know how to sell product and market product. And that's why I know you, you'll do a great job. And we became uh, the biggest uh, maker wow. of telephones in the country. That's, that's pr pretty impressive. That part's news to me. Um, but on the, on the hair care side and the hair products and accessories, uh, it's a very crowded, competitive market. And one thing I've, um, uh, you know, observed about Conair products is they're moderately priced, affordable. Um, there's a, a ton of selection and choice um, at all levels. Do you have a specific uh, target market that you are that you go after or, um, you know, it, it, as far as the like I said, you're, you're kind of a leader in that area, too, is. Um, is the moderate price. The philosophy of the company was always to deliver a quality product at a reasonable price. And that together with what we felt we did a, a very good job with in marketing uh, and promotion re really, I think, is uh, what you could attribute our success to. And as you mentioned earlier, you, you have several hair dryers or had several hair dryers over the years, uh, hopefully many of them, which were ours. But we, we viewed our job and because of the price points, we were able to uh, sell the product and position the product to convince you to, that you needed another one. Right. So 
you, you may want a dryer for, uh, for your, your bathroom or each of your bathrooms for that matter. But now it's Valentine's Day and we have a pink one or it's, uh, you know, a, a charity that we're doing and we, 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 we have a, a pink dryer or, you know, Fourth of July, uh, some type of celebratory piece and holidays, etc. So we would do fashion collections and all types of promotional um, positioned product to convince you and again, together with the price point why you should have this impulse purchase. Excellent. Yeah, I, I love the products. What kinds of tips do you have for other entrepreneurs, um, either, you know, who have your um, track of a family business or just beginning their own business? I mean, there's a, a, a lot of opportunities for entrepreneurs and they're, they're a different breed nowadays, but it's always nice to hear tips from folks who have already, um, you know, walked that trail. I think the most tried and true advice that has been given to me and that I, that I like to share and pass on is focus because too often, you know, too many people, they, they have a passion, they get excited, they want to get into a business, but now they're running, they're, they're doing that business and then they're, they're trying to do three other businesses at the same time. And, if you stay focused and you believe in what you want to do, that is going to be your, your number one chance for success. And I, I quite often would tell a story within the industry that when we would develop a product, you know, we, we would view that as the initial, uh, if you want to call it conception, uh, you know, at the starting point. And you may have this great idea or this idea was brought to you but what you have to be conscious of is simultaneously around the world three other people may have gotten the same idea just statistically it's very probable right so now i call that the window of opportunity and from the moment you have that idea who reacts first is going to be generally you know the 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 one that has the most chance of success because immediately that window begins to close the window of opportunity. So you have to capture and seize upon that opportunity before the window closes upon you and somebody else, you know, already took advantage of what that same idea. Well, that, I, it's very interesting. And our small business owners, um, you know, enjoy hearing tips from some of the founders and, and uh, of large corporations like yours, um, you know, that started out as small businesses. Um, every large company starts as a small company, right? Absolutely. Lee, you were talking about focus. And just yesterday, actually, we were having another conversation with another great American dream story. His name is Bob Letty. started a company called Captive Air in the uh, restaurant uh, ventilation systems. And he exactly said that. He goes, you know, we hear a lot of people talk about serial entrepreneurs and we celebrate serial entrepreneurs. And uh, he goes, he goes, but it really is about focus. You have to really focus on a business to be able to successfully grow it into a large business. If you keep going from one thing to another to another, um, sometimes that really doesn't lead to success. Um, and uh, it's interesting, you literally said the almost the exact same thing. And so I think there's something out there for our small business entrepreneurs and um, who, who, who wonder how they're gonna grow into becoming a bigger business is you need to focus um, and stay focused. And you know, it, it's not it's not always easy. You you can have that focus, and you have to be uh, committed to it. In our early years, uh, starting out in Brooklyn, New York, uh, back in the the early '60s, the company had two major fires, and several mm -hmm. robberies, and uh, plus, uh, my grandfather died by the the mid '60s. So it was, uh, you know, a tremendous, tremendous hardships my dad experienced right in the midst of, of trying to, you know, get this company off the ground. And with that, you, you need to have that fortitude to, to go forward and, and, and conviction that, you know, this is something you believe in and you're not going to give up. Yeah, upon. no, absolutely. Maybe, maybe we should leave serial entrepreneurship up to uh, Kellogg's. No, I'm just kidding. That's a bad pun. <laughs> So, uh, but but yeah. switching over to uh, policy discussion, Lee, because I know that's something that uh, is near and dear to your heart. You uh, worked under the Trump administration as U.S. general counsel under under Trump. 
Um, so you saw a lot of the different policies that he implemented that really led to the success of the economy. And unfortunately, this administration, the Biden administration, is really uh, killing a lot of that success. But a major, major part of what Trump did from day one was to really try to establish not only energy leadership, but really energy dominance uh, across the country. And this administration, unfortunately, from day one, decided to attack uh, our, our domestic energy market, which I contest is you know, probably one of the biggest reasons why he, he really destabilized the entire energy market, which I think has led to you know, the, the war in Ukraine and other, uh, uh, you know, other things that we're seeing across the globe. Um, but, but, but talk to me a little bit about your, your point of view on kind of energy dominance and independence that's desperately needed here in the U.S. Well, I'll start with first uh, uh, really echoing your, your, your feelings, uh, you know, interpretation of uh, what Biden has done, and I couldn't agree more. The, what uh, Biden has done is uh, enriched and empowered our adversaries uh, foremost which is most unfortunate. So besides turning his back on literally tens of thousands of American workers and businesses, you simultaneously enriched and empowered your adversaries, which doesn't get worse than that. So you, you got struggling American families and, and, and so many lost opportunities. We really, yeah, as we all know, we finally achieved energy independence. And as though they pulled the carpet out from under your feet, that, you know, it was quickly, you know, taken away, you know, from us and every, every American in this country. But in, in my uh, assessment of what was going on, I, I started exploring some information and hunches that I had that led me down a path that was completely startling and somewhat profound. Because what, what I found out in doing some just basic investigation is the, the US imports uh, 8.3 uh, million barrels of, of oil per day. This, this tremendous quantity that's being imported on a daily basis that we have the ability to produce ourselves. But besides uh, empowering and enriching your adversaries, what was discovered while I was doing this research is the tremendous amount of pollution that's caused by importing this oil. So the tanker ships that deliver this oil, number one, they're not going to Exxon or Mobile and, and put in unleaded fuel in, in to run these ships. They, they're used in bunker oil, which is the most crudest form of oil and the most the highest pollutant type of oil. So they're burning this, you know, extremely dirty oil that's producing 58,000 pounds of carbon emission per hour to deliver the oil to the U.S. Now, put in some perspective and depth to that, if you take a ship that goes from uh, Saudi uh, Arabia to New York, it's 6,500 nautical miles. And th those, those tanker ships are generally running about 17 miles per hour. So that would equate to about 380, a little over 380 hours travel time, which simple math, it's over a million gallons of fuel being burned one way. And depending on the ship, it actually could be double that. Plus, don't forget, the ship has to go home. So now you have countless ships on a daily basis from all over the world. It's not obviously they don't just come from Saudi Arabia, but they're coming from all over the world. That if you took the one ship one way, from, using the example from Saudi Arabia, 58,000 pounds per, per hour, it's 22 million pounds of carbon being dumped into our ocean and atmosphere on a daily basis. That's just one ship, but potentially it's somewhere between, who, I, I, I never did the actual calculation of where all the ships are coming from, but 
10 ships, 20 ships, 50 ships, you know, or, or 10 million, 20 million, 50 million gallons per day being burned uh, to deliver the oil, but then multiply that times the carbon emission that's being dumped into the oceans and the atmosphere. And what that led me to is a, you know, realizing it's not just the tanker ships that are causing this massive pollution, but also the container ships and the cruise ships. They all basically uh, put in the, the similar pollution out there to the extent there's a ship, uh, actually several, that has the equivalent burn of 50 million cars, one ship. So it, it is just, it, it, it's, I, I hate to say comical, it's, it's actually sad that all the focus is on, oh, we, we have the car industry and how we're going to, you know, benefit the world by improving, you know, going to electric vehicles and improving the emissions of cars. Well, if you add up all the cars in the world, which is estimated to be seven, eight hundred million cars, they produce less than 10 percent of pollution wow. of the ships wow. in That's total. Crazy. Right. So it, it's just staggering numbers that I, I hope at some point the U.S. and the rest of the world really takes uh, control of in respect to the, the pollution of these ships. But it's uh, the result of the unnecessary importation uh, of oil that we already have. So we, we are just killing the planet with the pollution unnecessarily when we already have it under our feet. Yeah, it's, it just seems absolutely ridiculous and then you know there, there there doesn't seem to be any rushed for regulations that i can see or have heard for these cruise ships or tankers or anything to try to address that i don't see any rush to uh, have ev tankers uh anytime soon uh that's for sure um and uh and by the way you know you and i talked about this you know these ev cars i mean they really are actually uh you know an issue because you have the batteries which are going to have to be disposed of somewhere you have the mining operations to get to all the materials to create the batteries, right? You have the wear and tear on roads because my understanding is an EV car weighs about 50% more than a combustion car. And so, you know, this, this, this panacea uh, or, or dream that this administration has is really going to become a nightmare, not only for the American public, but I think for the world. Uh, absolutely. And the, the irony of California passing uh, a statutory uh, uh, bills that will require the trucks picking up the containers at the ports to be electric in the very near future. When meanwhile, the ships, they, they, they have their eyes closed to the pollution the ships are causing and they're attacking the, the truck drivers that are just trying to feed their families. Yeah. It, it's crazy. To your point, we have the energy that we need right under our feet. Yet this administration just, you know, trying to, you know, appease the, the far left woke crowd uh, has really put us on a very dangerous path. And, you know, my concern, as I mentioned right at the top here, that, you know, the impact it is in terms of feeding our adversaries with, you know, money that frankly is being used against us in wars and uh, against, you know, in many cases, our allies, like I believe it's being used in Israel with the, the Iranian folks uh, using some of those dollars against the Israelis. And, and that that's really the, the unfortunate, you know, uh, part that every death that has resulted, ultimately, you know, we have a yeah. dotted line to because if they didn't have the money and they weren't empowered, Chances are they wouldn't have, uh, you know, taken the actions they have taken. And, you know, ultimately, you know, our policies, uh, you know, have a, a dotted line, you know, responsibility. Yeah. To so so what, what's the answer, Lee? I mean, what, what do we need to do? I mean, obviously, we're going to have to change something. I guess we have to change the administration in 24. Oh, well, we, uh, we, we, we really need to get back to a, a conservative uh, direction. Uh, we we need to take the house. It, it, we have a very clear candidate. You know, uh, with President Trump's numbers are just uh, incredible. But not just his numbers. It, 
his energy level is, is just unbelievable. I have the good fortune to see him every once in a while. And we were with him uh, last week. And uh, he stopped in. We, we were having some meetings. He stopped in the room to say hello to the group. And uh, then he said, listen, I'm not even supposed to be here. Actually, I'm on the way to the airport. He was going to his sister's uh, funeral. And he leaves. He flies to New York. He's back actually the next day for another event, speaks at that event for 90 minutes straight, completely composed, completely nice. coherent, unlike, you know, uh, you know, the current president. And the next day he's back on a plane again to go feed a border patrol wow. agents. His, his, his energy is just tremendous, but his, his mind is equally as tremendous and we really need to, to have this man back in office. And I tell people all the time, if, if you're having brain surgery and there was one surgeon, only one in the world that has done this job and done this procedure that you need to have done, would you want that person right. to do the surgery? Or would you want the person that said, I think I could do the job. I have all the credentials to do the job, you know, pick me instead. I want tried and proven. I want the guy that has demonstrated his patriotism to this country, his love for this country, and the results that he's delivered. That's what we need foremost uh, uh, now, you know, and hopefully come 2025. Yeah, I, I, I mean, no doubt, Elaine, uh, you and I have worked really hard during the uh, Tax and Jobs Act trying to get that passed. Um, but, you know, that was just one part of a very successful economic plan for our country that, you know, really put everybody in a much better position. I know that Hispanics, for example, uh, you know, I was part of uh, Latinos for Trump. Um, quite frankly, Hispanics never did better than under the Trump administration. And so uh, those economic policies, uh, they weren't hypothetical. They were real policies that really worked for the, you know, the real working public and the American public. And, uh, you know, I actually will say, though, Lee, that I'm actually really excited that Biden is going around the country touting Bidenomics uh, because, uh, frankly, I'm actually giddy about that because I never thought in a million years that someone would be so dumb to go around and actually tout one of the largest failures in American history than Bidenomics and actually be willing to put his name on it. I actually thought he was going to blame the Republicans uh, for it. So I'm actually excited because in 24, I still predict we're going to have some level of recession and the American public is going to know that they were better off four years ago than they are today. Well, and, and I agree. What, unfortunately, sometimes it has to get bad before it gets good, as the doctor would say, it gets worse before it gets better. And the public, mainly through the media, has been sold such a bill of goods about how this man is divisive and he's uh, you know too rough and speaks too aggressively, this and that. Number one, as you know, with the many businesses uh, that you deal with, if, uh, if I'm looking for a, a senior person, I want some, a, a tough guy in the job or lady, somebody that's competent, strong, and, and gonna you know, be able to you know, do the job. I don't want a cream puff coming in saying, okay, I want a right. participation trophy and I, I just killed your business. I want the guy that's going to be, you know, fully competent and, and aggressive to run my business or, or, or different parts of my businesses. And that's what, that's what you had with President Trump. So, yeah, I, I agree that the Biden omics uh, has been, you know, terrible. And perhaps it finally opened the eyes to, to many people on both sides of the aisle to say, hey, maybe everything we're hearing on NBC and CNN and all these different news channels isn't really, you know, you yeah. know, accurate. And the, the fact of the matter is people have the ability to hear with their own ears and see with their own eyes and ultimately formulate right. their own opinions, you know, and all the uh, the media propaganda has distorted right. their perspective. Right. Absolutely. So, Lee, what, what else do you have uh, uh, on your agenda uh, to help save our country along with uh, 
uh, hopefully a future president, uh, conservative president in the White House? Well, I, I truly hope that we could put together a significant opportunity for U.S. companies that are currently doing business international and buying, you know, pro importing product from around the world, that what I believe would be a, a tremendous opportunity for our country and continent to, for the U.S. to create a, a manufacturing incentive program to produce in, in Mexico and Central America, right. South America as well, and to say, okay, we, we want to, you know, produce everything we can. And, and that's great. But we only have so many people and, and so, so many resources and, and there's probably categories that we don't want to produce. So there's tremendous opportunity to have the U.S. look at Central America, Mexico, even South America, as I mentioned, to produce product. And if we were able to create the uh, uh, incentive for these companies and, and some type of commitment, I would think for a company to say, all right, I'm moving to a new country, you're, you really have to give them a minimum of a 20 year right. kind of yeah. protection. So I'm not saying write these companies checks, but you, you don't want to move, move a company to a country and then they are told, okay, now the duty for right. that country next right, year right. is going to be 200%. You give them the protection and the incentive that if we do this, then they'll have that protection. But ultimately, how does that help America? So my, my thought is by, by putting these companies there and, and building a number, you know, you could talk, you're talking about potentially tens of thousands of factories, you're stabilizing these regions. So by bringing jobs and economic prosperity to these regions, one, you're stabilizing them, and two, now you don't need these countries don't need to have the mass exodus to the U.S. Right. and running across the border. By people having jobs and making money and being able to provide for their family, they don't have to, you know, take that godforsaken trip, you know, th through jungles and, and uh, you know, all the terror that exists coming across the border and through Correct. the hotels and the, the, the fortune of the treatment uh, by them. And now guess what? Besides all the benefits that that would bring, that product would come to the U.S. by truck or rail, and you don't need to use the the uh, the, the tanker ships or the the container ships that are causing all the pollution. So there would be so many benefits by having a a plan that in, encompasses Mexico, Central America, potentially South America, to to have a long term manufacturing focus. Yeah, and I think that was actually part of the rationale of, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but of Trump getting rid of NAFTA and bringing in the USMCA. Um, that was kind of that thinking, exactly. It, 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 I believe so also, and it's, but it's taking that thinking and bringing it to a, the whole next level. Lee, I was just going to um, focus on the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act um, and just share with you some of the stories. You know, we work a lot with small business owners and really trying to amplify those stories about how um, policies impact them. And what I can tell you about um, the Trump tax cuts is our small business owners, and just anecdotally, I'll share a couple of things. We have a Pennsylvania manufacturer, for example, who um, was able to double the size of his facility, um, hire uh, new employees, add jobs, um, give Christmas or annual bonuses to his company. And, and one of the most important things for him, because he's in a rural area of Pennsylvania, was to be able to offer a, a retirement plan, a 401k for his employees. And in, in the more than decade that he'd been in business, he was unable to do that. And now that he was, and the reason why that was so important is because he's got about 200 employees. And what they saw in their town is they were losing their youth um, and so he was one of the anchor companies that could keep people in the town and keep the town growing. And so the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act didn't just have an impact on his personal life or even just his business, but it provided a way to keep the youth in the town. And so when you talk about 
um, even the international example you were giving about jobs um, in other countries and stabilizing them, stabilizing small uh, rural areas with uh, the right policies is important too, because that's what keeps communities going. And those are the kinds of stories that Americans need to hear through the media. And that's what we try to really amplify those voices of small businesses so they can hear how good policies really impact the country as a whole, not just that business owner. I, I wholeheartedly agree. And I, I would add to that, that what other countries do for small businesses and big businesses alike is we, we have a, a duty and tariff pool that we're, we're, we're taxing products coming into the country. And really that pool should be the resource and the, the funds to help small businesses as well as big businesses in new technology, in education, in tooling, in equipment, that the country should be focused on, besides just the statements, you know, we want to do more business. How do you do more business? How do you help these, how do you help these businesses and, and, and communities uh, flourish and, and continue to grow. So if we actually tapped into that uh, funds that, you know, all these dollars that are coming into the country be, through the duty and tariffs, you have a tremendous amount of money available to, to help these uh, businesses. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Lee, I want to thank you for joining Main Street Matters and sharing your perspective and your tips for future entrepreneurs. Um, Main Street Matters is America's uh, megaphone. So thank you so much for joining us. And, and for those of you watching or listening, you can subscribe to the show at SalemPodcastNetwork.com or wherever you get your podcast from.